This morning I want to talk to you for a little while on ordained ministers before God or before world governments. To all of those who have dedicated their lives to Jehovah, we fully appreciate that we are ordained of God to be his ministers in the earth and to represent him by preaching the good news of the kingdom. Jehovah's Witnesses everywhere recognize dedic dedicated persons who have symbolized their baptism as ordained ministers. To be an ordained minister means that the individual takes on a great responsibility. It is necessary for every individual so dedicated to prove his ministry. Not only you who are graduating from this school today, but all of God's people around the world, beyond the Iron Curtain on this side, north and south, on all the continents of the earth, everyone who has been dedicated and has been baptized must prove it. Now you of this class have uh, proved long before you ever came to school that you were ordained ministers by the work that you engaged in, by your taking on the responsibility of preaching the good news of the kingdom. And today you find yourselves very happy and in full accord with the text of the year, happy is the one that stays awake and keeps his outer garments, that he may not walk naked and people look upon his parts of shame. <coughs> While at this moment you have come to school after many years of service and you are happy, you have stayed awake, you are in God's service, you still have on your ministerial garments and this brings you great satisfaction in life. But there is the possibility that you might lose them if you fall asleep. A person who has dedicated himself to God's service takes his assignment from God and stays awake on that assignment. And it is our prayer that all of you will always keep your ministerial garments on. That you'll always stay awake and on guard and keep alive to the glorious treasure that you now have of being an ordained minister, of being a representative of the sovereign ruler Jehovah. To be such a minister of course and to prove that you have these outer garments on takes proof. Up to this moment you have given that proof. But God so works with his people that the proof doesn't only last for two or three years or maybe four or five years after you get out of school and then you say, well, God, I've given you enough proof that I am an ordained minister. No, it's proof that we give to God all our life. We have dedicated all that we have to his service and we hope that that service and that joy of living will run on through endless ages to come. And all of that time we will, give, we will be giving proof to Jehovah God that we are his servants, his people, always doing what he wants us to do, interested in the divine will. So keep in your mind that you must continue to prove after leaving school that you are going to be an ordained minister. And every time that you are checked up on your activity, you will always have good proof of your glorious treasure and that you are really taking care of it. It isn't too difficult on our part, as long as we are doing the divine will to prove that we are ordained ministers to Jehovah God. 
he has brought us into his new world society and has assigned us to positions of responsibility within that organization. But to prove this to the world has been a very difficult proposition. But then we're not trying to prove it to the world governments. If there are laws in the world that uh, make provision for ordained ministers being exempted in certain duties or activity towards the governments, well and good. But very few nations of the earth today recognize the distinction between ordained ministers and the rest of their population. In the country of Britain, we don't even have an ordained minister, not one in the side of the government, even though we are a religious organization. And there are upwards of 40,000 persons belonging to that religious organization. The government of England says you do not have even one person that is an ordained minister. But that doesn't make any difference to us. We are not the servants of the state. We have become the servants of God. We have made it clear that we believe God's word and that we will follow his will regardless. And we'll also follow all the laws of the land if these laws are in full accord with God's law. But to us, God's law is first, no matter what land we live in. We are a kind of people that are not fighting governments. We are not opposed to governments. If it is God's will that government shall rise and fall, then we are certainly in accord with God's arrangement for this world. But he has called us out of this world for a particular purpose, to make known the good news of his kingdom unto the ends of the earth. Ordained means to invest with ministerial functions or to appoint authoritatively. One who has been ordained is commissioned to preach the good news of the kingdom. One who is ordained is appointed to God's service. According to our understanding, every Christian must be a minister. Now, our society doesn't say that just you persons who have gone through the school here at Gilead are ordained ministers. You are, it is true. But we say that all of God's people over the world who have dedicated themselves to Jehovah's service and have symbolized that dedication by baptism are ordained of God, are appointed by him to special service. Paul the apostle recognized this when he said, for with the heart one exercises faith for righteousness, but with the mouth one makes public declaration for salvation. Every one of God's people who have shown faith in his word and in his work and have dedicated themselves to God's service, whether they be a congregational publisher, a pioneer, a graduate of Gilead, an overseer in a congregation, all alike have the same faith and have the same responsibility to, to make public declaration to other persons concerning the salvation God has provided for mankind. The head of the Christian church was ordained by God as expressed in Isaiah 61, 1-3 and Jesus applied this ordination to himself. And he said, Jehovah's Spirit is upon me because he anointed me to declare good news to the poor. He sent me forth to preach, to preach a release to the captives and a recovery of the sight to the blind, to send the crushed ones away with a release 
to preach Jehovah's acceptable year. Here an individual comes forth out of the Jewish nation, the Son of God, and when he had made his dedication and symbolized it in the Jordan River, he went forth then to do the will of his Father. He was ordained by his Father in heaven, by Holy Spirit, to do a work. And there was no government on the earth, no religious organization that could interfere with that work. There was no government or organization that could persuade him to do otherwise than the will of God. They could stop him, yes, by taking away his life, and that they did. But before the governments of the earth and the religious organization of the Jews took his life, this one Christ Jesus, ordained of God, did a marvelous preaching work. He established Christianity, and he trained those that were with him to be ordained ministers just like himself. Christ Jesus' followers received the same ordination and carry upon their shoulders this very same responsibility that Jesus did. For they have taken up the command of Christ, wherein he said, and this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all worldwide and as we preach this good news it releases the captives to these devilish governments of the earth it recovers the sight of those who have been blinded to God's word it helps those who have been crushed by these governments of the earth to come to life again and even make a dedication and become ministers even as you and I are and they continue to do this until the accomplished end. There is no slowing down, there's no time period. We're not signing up just for a brief period of three years or ten years. It's for life that we prove that we are on duty as a servant of God, one who is ordained of him. How far-reaching is this ordination? Does it just apply to uh, the time in which we are preaching? When we say we are an ordained minister, does it just mean that, well, as we go from house to house and talk for a few hours a month? Or are we just an ordained minister when we make a back call? Or while we are conducting a Bible study? Is it just to this confinement of our preaching that we are ordained ministers? Or does this idea of ordination take in a much broader scope? First of all, we ought to read the definition of what an ordained minister is from uh, the International Dictionary, Webster's. Under the subject of theology, under the definition of vocation, it says, a calling to the service of God in a particular station or state of life, especially in the priesthood or religious life, as shown by one's fitness, natural inclinations, and often by conviction of a divine invitation. The station or state of life to which one receives such a calling, an official invitation to a particular ecclesiastical office as a pastorate. Well now this shows that uh, when one is called uh, to be a minister of God and he takes this up as, as his vocation, it is his full-time work. Well can we say that a person who is a congregational publisher, a person that only puts in a few hours going from house to house and conducting a few Bible studies a month has made the uh, Christian ministry his vocation, his full-time service. 
Does it mean that uh, this dedication of his has been a calling or summons to a particular activity or a career? Is it a full-time work for all of us, whether we are missionaries, pioneers, or congregational publishers? Well, the definition indicates that it's a divine call to God's service or to a Christian life. Now, if we're called to live as Christ Jesus did, and we have made a dedication to do the will of God, then that takes in our whole life. Our life changes. It, just, it doesn't confine itself to going from door to door. It doesn't confine itself to a Bible study that we may conduct. Our whole life is involved in this Christian dedication, this ordination that we receive from Jehovah God. Therefore, one's vocation, if he is a Christian, means his having been ordained by God with a divine call to divine service. That is to lead a full Christian life. Now, are we doing that? Often we say, well, that person is because he's in the full-time service. But aren't all of the congregational publishers in the full-time service of God? Aren't they leading a Christian life? They must. If they are ordained ministers of God, if they have dedicated their lives to God's service and they have been baptized, they must lead a complete Christian life in order to prove their ordination to Jehovah God. Certainly we do not think that only those who are in the full-time service, these 130 students here today, of this whole group, are the only ones that are Christians, or are the only ones that are leading a Christian life. No, we believe that everyone here that has dedicated his life to God's service and has been baptized in water and has declared himself before witnesses that he is a ordained minister, that he is going to lead a Christian life from that moment on, and be different, be conspicuous as an ordained minister. One does not live as a Christian just on a Sunday for a few hours. It is his whole life that is changed. His life's work is set, which makes that his vocation. Now, there's a difference between one's vocation and his avocation. Avocation means a minor or occasional occupation or a hobby. Uh, maybe when you come home from work, you like to go down in the cellar and tinker on a little carpenter bench that you put up, and you like to put things together for your wife, or you just like to fuss around with a chisel and a saw and a hammer and make little things, and it's a hobby, but you're not a carpenter. That's an avocation. Now, do you look at your dedication to Jehovah God as an avocation, as a hobby, as something just to do on a Sunday? to go out in the field service from door to door or maybe on a Wednesday evening have a Bible study? Is it just a hobby? Is it just a part-time job with you? Or is your dedication to Jehovah God a full-time work? When you dedicated yourself to Jehovah's service, did it become your vocation or your avocation? Let's look at it from a scriptural viewpoint alone. Religion to us is not a side issue. It isn't the small thing in our life. Our service to Jehovah God is the big thing in our life, the only thing in our life. And so the scriptures indicate that that is exactly the way it must be for every one of us as long as we live. 
Making a dedication to Jehovah God and being baptized is not a hobby, nor is it a minor occupation. Not with a Christian. Well, now, just how far-reaching is our dedication? Well, let's read first of all 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and the 31st verse. And this is how far-reaching it is. Your vocation, your work as an ordained minister. Therefore, whether you are eating or drinking or doing anything else, do all things for God's glory. Keep from becoming causes for stumbling to Jews as well as Greeks and to the congregation of God, even as I am pleasing all people in all things, not seeking my own advantage, but that of the many. Why? In order that they might get saved. Imagine it, saving people just by eating and drinking. That brings it down to our daily, ordinary living. What we do from morning until night. And that's our vocation. That's our Christian ministry. What we're doing day by day is going to save people's lives. Well, how? Paul tries to make all men Christians. And his very momentary activity, every minute, every hour, that Paul is alive, he has in mind saving people's lives. In this particular instance, it's in relation to the things he was eating. And if you read the whole account, you'll see that uh, if Paul was going to eat something that would stumble another person, he wouldn't eat it. Because he was interested in that other man's conscience, and he didn't want that man to stumble because of what he was doing. He wouldn't drink anything if it would stumble someone else. So Paul's every movement, every thought as to what he ate, as to what he drank, he was interested in the salvation of other people, Jews and Greeks. And in those days, eating had a lot to do with religion. The sacrifices that were offered to demon gods or the sacrifices that may be offered to the true God, partaking at the table of demons or partaking at the table of God. We might say, well, those are days that are gone. No. We're still living. We're still eating. We're still drinking. Sometimes people who have dedicated themselves to Jehovah God drink too much of certain kind of beverages, alcoholic beverages, and it makes them a little tipsy. It makes them careless. It makes them loose. It breaks down their morals. The high principles by which they have been living and been taught from God's word are relaxed. And some people might say, well, I can take it. I can drink. It doesn't bother me. And they may want to induce other people to do the same thing that they do because sometimes they have a little streak of conscience. It bothers me to be drinking so much. But if I could get that brother to drink and that sister to drink and that person to drink, well, I have so many more people on my side and it doesn't look so bad. But maybe those other people don't want to drink. Maybe by your inducing them and arguing into their mind that they should be drinking like you're drinking, you may stumble that one. So your very eating or drinking might take a person out of the truth and he loses the salvation that he's already gained. So don't you see that the very thing that you do, do day by day, your, your everyday living, 
is an important thing not only to yourself but to all of your brothers and your sisters. Your very actions all day long are watched by your brothers. Not that we're going around snooping and looking at everybody, no. <laughs> but uh, what you do becomes common sight to us. The way you dress, the way you comb your hair, whether you're clean or whether you are dirty, whether you study your lessons or you don't care, all that uh, people see. We notice it. And because of what we see about individuals, certain personalities uh, develop and we form an idea about different people. So to certain individuals, you'll give a greater responsibility in an organization or you give them a less responsibility because of their interest, their intensity on a certain subject or a work that's to be done. And we're not all alike. Many people have capabilities of doing certain kinds of things and uh, within an organization those people are often directed into that type of service, others into another. But no matter what we're doing, eating, drinking, association, our morals, our speech, what we say, all has an effect on other people. Now as it has an effect on other people, are we helping the Jew or are we driving him away from the organization? Are we helping the Greek or are we pushing him away from the organization? Paul says whatever he did was in order that they might get saved. Now are we thinking of our daily lives with that same force? At Colossians, the third chapter, in the 16th and 17th verse, it's just as powerful as Paul stated at Corinthians where he talks about eating and drinking. And here he says, Let the word of Christ reside in you richly in all wisdom. Keep on teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, praises to God, spiritual songs with graciousness. Sing in your hearts to Jehovah, and whatever it is that you do, now think about that. And whatever it is that you do in word or in work, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, thanking God the Father through him. My, what a, a terrific scope that is. Everything that you say every word. Well, James gave us the same point when he said, how can salt water and sweet water come out of the same uh, spring? How can bad words and good words come out of the same mouth? Well, Paul here says every word that you say has to do with your, uh, your salvation, your preaching, your ministry, your work as a Christian. And whatever it is that you do in word or in work, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now can we tie Christ Jesus in with our everyday occupation? Can we tie him in with our office work? Can we tie him in with our factory work? Can we tie him in with working in a store? You should. You have to if you're a Christian. If you are going to make your dedication to Jehovah God your vocation, your life's work, if you're going to show that you are a Christian life is the thing that you're interested in and that alone, then the very work that you do every day for your employer is going to be a work expressing that Christian life every word that you speak to people in normal conversation every time you talk to your wife or to your children or to your neighbors or to your brothers in the congregation 
it's going to show your Christian life. It's going to show your ordination, your dedication, your interest in doing the will of God. You're living according to the arrangements that God has set out in his word. That takes in a lot, doesn't it? So eating, drinking, speaking, our daily occupation, no matter where we are, our Christian life must reflect that we are ordained ministers and all day long our vocation is that of a minister, a personal representative of God in the earth concerning his wonderful kingdom and the people that he is dealing with. Note that it says, whatever you do in word or in work, you are doing everything in the name of Jesus Christ and you're thanking God. Now can we always do that? As we live our daily lives, as we work together in a missionary home, as we live in a branch, the branch office of the society, as we go out in the special pioneer work, as we uh, serve as a congregational publisher, can we feel that everything we're doing is with uh, a thought of thanking God, the Father, through Jesus Christ. We see from this that it includes every action that we perform. Now to make it even more forcefully, look what Jesus said in Matthew the 14th chapter in the 14th to 16th verse. He says, you are the light of the world. A city cannot be hid when situated upon a mountain. People light a lamp and set it, not under a measuring basket, but on a lampstand, and it shines upon all those in the house. Likewise, let your light shine before mankind, that you may see, that they may see your light, your right works, and give glory to your Father who is in the heavens. You might say, well, how does that fit in? Well, who are you? You're Christians. You're dedicated to the service of Jehovah God. You're ordained ministers. And he says, let your light shine. Now, where are you? You're up here on a lampstand all the time, letting your light shine. You're just like that city at the top of the hill. Well, uh, when you don't want people to see you, you can't say, well, let's get that city away and hide it so nobody can see what I'm doing now because I'm not going to be so good. I'm going to be a little bad. I don't want people to see what I'm doing now, so let's get the city hid. You don't hide a city. Well, you're the light of the world. You're always up here. People are looking at you. Let your light shine. Not just when you go from house to house. Not just when you're conducting a Bible study do you turn this light on and say, well, now I'm an ordained minister. No, you're an ordained minister all day long, 24 hours a day. And you let your light shine continually. It's your vocation. It's your life's work. It isn't something that even congregational publishers can say, well, I'm an ordained minister just a few hours a month. Not if you're making your Christian work your life's work. Then it's got to be your work all day long, even though you are a congregational publisher. So what does it do to you? It puts all of the congregational publishers right into the full-time service. No, we don't call them pioneers and special pioneers and missionaries, no. But you're in the full-time service of Jehovah God, your ordained ministers, letting your light shine all the time. You can't put it under a bushel, hide it under a basket. You can't take that city away and say, well, don't look at it now. I'm not a Christian for the next five hours or the next couple of days. No, you're there. You're conspicuous. People are looking at you. You must always shine wherever you are. You must always be the light of the world. We don't put this light out when we want to. We do not just hang it up and 
put it on a lampstand when we go from house to house, witnessing and conducting Bible studies and doing what we say well is preaching, is helping people gain salvation. No, these other scriptures we've had in consideration, it's our everyday life, our moral living, our way of life as Christians that affects everyone around us. We must keep this in mind. It cannot hide itself, this light of God, for a little bit of a time and then let come back and turn on the light again like we do these lights here. No, we have been brought into Jehovah's organization and we have been designated the light of the world and that light has to shine all the time. Now you missionaries, you who are finishing school today and going out in the field will certainly keep this in mind whether you're in the missionary work all your life or in a branch all your life or if something turns up that may take you into some other field, maybe as a congregational publisher, your occupation hasn't changed. Your vocation, your work is still that of a Christian. It's Christian life that you have taken on. You can't change it. You can't throw it off. You can't stop watching. You must always be on the watch. And that is true of every congregational publisher around the world. When we read our year's text, then it comes on with greater meaning that we're on the watch and we're not going to lose our ministerial garments. We want to keep them on all the time. And that applies just as much to the congregational publisher as it does to the full-time worker. So then when we, made, when we are made Christian ministers by Jehovah God because of our dedication and our baptism and our taking on all of these responsibilities, then we're going to be a glow day and night. Whether we be of the anointed or of the great multitude, it doesn't make any difference. We must be a glow with the Spirit and let our light shine. Our light shines all of the time, no matter where we're working. The way a person acts every day manifests itself, and Paul stated it this way, the sins of some men are publicly manifest, leading immediately to judgment. But as for other men, their sins also become manifest later. In the same way also, the right works are publicly manifest and those that are otherwise cannot be kept hid. Now here Paul is telling us when he's talking to Timothy at 1 Timothy 5, 24 and 25 that many times when people are doing wrong and they commit sins they're found out right away and so when they're found out they're put in jail or they're punished or they're fined, something happens to them because their sins are found out immediately. But sometimes there are people that are able to steal and rob or commit fornication, adultery, do all kinds of things that are wrong, and they're not found out. It's hid. But he says sometime they're going to be found out. Their judgment doesn't come right away. The sins committed, the judgment lingers because he isn't found out, but in time. But as for other men, their sins also become manifest later. Now this same principle that applies to wrongdoing applies to right doing, to good works. Sometimes, as we go from house to house and preach salvation to the people, uh, people see our good works. They may even invite us in and have us come back and uh, we have a Bible study. The whole congregation sees our good works and they're pleased that we're publishers, that we're bringing people into the truth and our good works, our right works are publicly manifest. But now there are many, many other things that you do that the congregation never sees, no one probably observes maybe like your eating and drinking. 
maybe like your words, maybe like your work in the office, maybe the way you talk to your children at home, maybe the way you talk to the people at work when you get away from home. Now these things aren't very manifest to many. But it does say that even your right works there that are not so manifest are going to bring forth results. The same as the thief that isn't caught right away, later on it's going to be found out and he'll get his judgment. And so even with your good works that are not made manifest now, they're going to make themselves manifest. In other words, we might read it in the right works that are not manifest right now will become manifest later and they cannot be hid. Don't be stingy on doing right things. Don't try to uh, make everything you do manifest to others so that they see everything that you're doing. As it's stated at Matthew 6, 1, take good, take good care not to practice your righteousness in front of men in order to be observed by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward with your Father who is in the heavens. And then in the third verse, he goes on to say, but you, when making gifts of mercy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your gifts of mercy may be in secret. Then your Father, who is looking on in secret, will repay you. There is where we want to get the blessing. God knows what we're doing. He knows what we're doing from the time we get up in the morning until we go to bed at night. He knows our very thoughts. He knows our intentions. He knows what we'd like to do even though we don't do them. And he's interested in us because we're his people, we're his ordained ministers. And even though the good things that we do are not always manifest to other people, God is observing. And that's what makes us live a Christian life. When we don't go out just to show off, we don't go out in the service just to make ours. We don't go out in the service just to prove to the congregational servant, I'm a good minister. We don't go out in the service just to put in 12 hours a month because it is a national average. We don't go out and put in 17 hours a month just because all of the congregation are averaging those hours. We're not going out in the service to be seen by men. We're going out because it's our work. We love it. And as we have the strength and ability to go out in that service, we, we make everything tend to bring about salvation for other people. So we become very good ordained ministers. But there's more to life and a Christian life than just going from door to door. That is a very important part of our life. We might say it's the principal part, the preaching of the good news of God's kingdom. It's necessary. That's what Jesus did, and that's what he taught his apostles to do. Preach this good news of the kingdom. The kingdom of the heavens is at hand. Declare it unto the ends of the earth. Go therefore and disciple all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's your work. But it doesn't end there. Paul later on in talking just about the simple things in life says that everything you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you speak, wherever you work, when you're at home with your family, when you're with your children, when you're with your wife, when you're with your neighbors, when you're in the congregation, all of this manifests itself as Christian life. Therefore, an ordained minister makes Christian living in every respect his life's work. And that applies to a congregational publisher just as much as you who have given yourself to what we term today full-time service. But we should think of congregational publishers as being in full-time service too because they're ordained ministers and you just don't turn off the light and turn it on on a Sunday morning and let it shine for a couple of hours and then turn it off and say, well, now it's a pioneer's job to preach, it's a missionary's, it's a Bethel home, it's their work. Their full-time work is no, that congregational publisher, everyone within God's organization is an ordained minister. It isn't something that we can 
take off like a coat and then put it on again. We're not like the clergy. Take this collar and turn it around backwards. <laughs> Try to make it fit. No. And then they point out, oh, there's a minister. No, they can see that you're ministers by what you're doing. And they'll see your right works. They'll be manifest, many of them. But there's a lot of good things that you're going to do that are not going to be manifest. Nor does it make any difference to us whether they are manifest. Because we're doing it for God. We're doing his service. So let us keep that in mind as we go along in our Christian activity henceforth. That we're here to serve Jehovah God. God sees what we're doing. We're his ministers. We're not here to serve men. We have an organization, true. God has built it up. And we all have our place within that organization as it pleases God. And we want to hold that place, just like you want to hold your position within Jehovah's organization, too. You all have assignments. You're all going to some country there to represent Jehovah God. You're not going there to please the president of the society. If you are, you're going to be a failure. But if you're going there to pre please Jehovah God and to carry out your Christian life, then you're going to be a success because then Jehovah's Spirit will be upon you. Look how successful our brothers are behind the Iron Curtain. They bring more people into the truth than we who are on the other side of the Iron Curtain, percentage-wise. It's marvelous. Look what's being done down in Africa where the people do not have the education, the uh, ability to express themselves or to read and to write. They're coming into the truth and the expressions of people on the outside as they look at Jehovah's Witnesses are amazing. They see here an organization that has brought people together that love truth and righteousness and they've done something to those people. They think that it's an organization that is doing it. And often people write to the society and want to know, what are your methods? How do you train them? Uh, what, uh, what is your method at school to uh, train the people the way you do? We'd like to follow them. But that wouldn't help even if they followed our methods. It's God's Holy Spirit. It's our hearts and our loves for God and his love for us and our coming together in one, recognizing our relationship to him that makes us do the things that we do. We love to do the will of our Father in heaven. That's why you're at school. That's why people are in the congregations. That's why people go to Africa, South America, Asia, anywhere in the world to preach the good news. Well, you just can't find people that will do that in the world today unless it's for money. But we do it for love. We love our Father. We want to serve him. We do it because we took up an occupation. We changed our trade, some of us many, many years ago, and some just a few years ago. We used to belong to an old wicked world. We used to serve it. We used to think the governments of the earth were just the finest thing and we voted for this person. We used to think this religion was a necessary thing and I must work in that religion. But it was all for this old world. And we were working for that master. But now we've changed our position. Now we've come to be a soldier in Christ's army. The whole situation is turned around. We've left that old world, all of its activity, and now we've moved into the new world society. We've dedicated ourselves, we've symbolized it by water baptism, and we've become a soldier in God's organization. And Paul, in writing to Timothy, at the second letter, the second chapter, 4 to 15, says, 
No man serving as a soldier involves himself in the commercial business of life in order that he may meet the approval of the one who enrolled him as a soldier. But shun empty speeches that violate what is holy, for they will advance to more and more ungodliness. Now here we see that Paul is telling Timothy that when you get into the army of Christ Jesus and you become a soldier, you don't involve yourself with the commercial business of this world. When we have once dedicated ourselves to Jehovah God and gotten into his Christian organization, oh, we might still be a carpenter, we might still work in a mill, we might still work in a store, we may be a stenographer, yes. But why? just so that we can be a soldier in Jehovah's organization. We're not going to be all mixed up with the things of this old world as to interfere with our great work, our vocation, that of Christian ministry, of Christian life. The other just supports us. We have to eat. We have to have some shelter. We need clothes. So many of the brothers throughout the world in the congregations hold positions of some kind and they get a payment for what they do. But all that is being done because they're seeking first the kingdom and its righteousness. Everything goes one way to help them live that Christian life. Now with you who are missionaries, those in Bethel families, special pioneers and pioneers, well, they've arranged their affairs in life so that they can pull even more away from the things of the world and give more time within Jehovah's organization to the preaching, which is the all-important thing, the big thing. That's what you have done. You've been doing it for many, many years. And there will be many more that will be joining you in this great preaching work. That is, in the same capacity that you're doing it. 150 hours, or in branches, or wherever Jehovah God assigns you through his organization. But you're serving as a soldier, and you're not going to involve yourself in the commercial business of life. Why? In order that you may meet the approval of the one who enrolled you as a soldier. You're seeking his approval. You want to always be right with Jehovah God and with his son, Christ Jesus. You want to walk the same way that his son walked when he was upon the earth. And Paul and the other apostles, they were faithful soldiers. And what did they do when they were walking as a faithful soldier? They shunned empty speeches. That uh, which violated that which was holy. For they all advanced, when they followed that course of action of doing the wrong thing, it all advanced to ungodliness. When you get mixed up with this old world and you start serving it and make the commercial things of this world and its materialism the important thing and you make a shift in your vocation, then the whole thing goes to ungodliness. But when we keep in our minds our real vocation, ordained ministers, Christian life, then we're not going to lean to commercialism or to materialism. We're going to keep our minds stayed on what God wants us to do. If you were part of the world, the world would be fond of what is its own. But because you are not a part of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, on this account the world hates you. It hates the whole organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. That's why throughout the world we don't even have an ordained minister in any country, except here in America they do have a law that recognizes some. But even though they may recognize just a few, that doesn't say the rest of us are not ordained ministers. We are. Just as much as our brothers behind the Iron Curtain are ordained ministers in Africa, in all of Europe, in England, where they don't even have a minister and 40,000 people belong to an organization. How stupid can people get? <laughs> but it doesn't make any difference to us. It may be that someday in this whole world 
the devil's organization will say that not one member of Jehovah's Witnesses is an ordained minister. They don't recognize one of us of having ordination from Jehovah God to preach the good news and let it be so. The whole of the devil's organization will go down and only those who are ordained ministers will remain, remain to receive life eternal within Jehovah's organization, whether it be in heaven or here upon the earth. Let all of us feel the grave responsibility that is ours as a minister of God. The world says that Jehovah's Witnesses are not ordained ministers. All right, let them say it. But we've got to prove otherwise. We're not going to prove to the heads of government or to their parliaments or to their congresses or to their cabinets or even to the rulers in cities or states that we are ordained ministers. All we have to do is prove it to God. It isn't to the world that we're proving our position. It's to Jehovah, our Father in heaven. Let us show that we are ordained ministers before God. Every one of us, whether we graduate from school, whether we be pioneers in any country, or congregational publishers. Let us prove by our works, day and night, by what we eat, by what we drink, by what we say, by the way we live, by the way our light shines, that we are ordained of God to be his ministers. What the world thinks, we don't care. We're right, because we have the truth. God has made us what we are today, and we're going to remain that way. I sincerely hope and pray that all of you who are finishing school today will continue faithful in your service as an ordained minister. You, as Christians within Jehovah's organization, have taken on a greater load of responsibility within the organization as missionaries, as persons who may be going to some branches. And as time goes on, many of you may be taking on heavier loads of responsibility as overseers within God's organization, circuit servants, district servants, maybe someday a zone servant. Practically all of the zone servants throughout the world today are graduates of Gilead, not because they're graduates of Gilead, no, but because they've proved their ministry, because the work they have been doing all day long in different parts of the earth qualify them to be good examples to the brother throughout the world as zone servants, as district servants, as circuit servants, as pioneers, as special pioneers, as missionaries, as congregational publishers. Wherever we are in God's organization, let us lead a Christian life. Let that be our vocation, not our avocation, not a part-time job with us. Make your Christian life your full life and prove that you truly are ordained ministers of Jehovah God. Now the time comes in your life when uh, You'll have to come up here and take one of these envelopes away. And it is true that some of you just haven't uh, made the, this mark where we draw the line. If you're above that, you get a diploma. If you're below, you don't. But I can tell you this, that many of the persons who have left Gilead School that didn't get a diploma have truly proved to be the best missionaries. You see, the diploma is only given on scholastic ability, what you know from the books. Uh, diplomas aren't handed out on heart condition. It isn't handed out on uh, your personality. But your heart and your personality may be able to bring more people into the truth 
than the individual that has all the brains in the world. As one of our instructors showed us this morning, if our hearts are right, if it's in here, it'll come out. And uh, so often, persons who haven't gotten diplomas have proved uh, the best missionaries. So don't let it be a discouragement to you at all, because after this morning, if you'd ask me tomorrow who got diplomas, I could take a guess. But uh, I couldn't tell you who doesn't get one. Most of you are going to by far, yes. But I don't remember who doesn't get a diploma. That doesn't make any difference to me. It's your coming here, it's your studying, it's your learning, it's your love for God, his organization, that's going to make you a successful minister somewhere else in the world. And I don't know of maybe a hundred persons that haven't gotten diplomas in the last six years uh, who they are with the exception of a few examples that I have in my mind that I know they didn't and they've been such fine, excellent missionaries. And they're still out in their foreign assignments for uh, 14 and 15 years of service. And we love them just as much as we love anyone else within Jehovah's organization. So sometimes I feel that giving you this envelope with a diploma isn't the important thing, but we have to finish it somewhere and put a period at the end of a sentence, otherwise you think there's going to be more. <laughs> so uh, now you know when you get this diploma or this envelope from the society that uh, that puts on the finish for your term at Gilead. It's been a real joy to have you here with us, and we'd like you to stay longer, but we brought you here because of the uh, great work that still has to be done in other parts of the world. This has been uh, one of our most interesting classes. They've all been most enjoyable. But when you can bring people from all over the earth to uh, a school like Gilead, and find that uh, you can get on so well and express yourself one to the other and all have the same fine spirit, it makes your heart glad. It, uh, it's another evidence to all of us that this is truly God's work. It's uh, his spirit that makes us uh, what we are today and is able to make us accomplish what he wants done. I'm a little more fortunate than the uh, instructors because they have to stay here and work and I can go and travel. So I'll get to see you again very likely, if it be Jehovah's will, coming to your various countries and uh, seeing you. I'll probably know you've been to Gilead, but uh, forgive me if I forget your name. <laughs> Some of you have... Uh, difficult names as you know as far as I'm concerned. I don't say them right and probably may make a few errors this morning. To another field to carry on the great work that God has given you to do. You are the light of the world. And that means all of us here are the light of the world. But this morning we're primarily interested in you, the 32nd class of Gilead. We're grateful to Jehovah God that he has brought this school into uh, action, that he has made it, and that he has used it in such a wonderful capacity. And as you have learned at the uh, Divine Will International Assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, this schooling and this educational work is going to take on a much broader field in another year from now, and that a good bit of education will be carried on in branch offices where we can bring in the overseers of the various congregations. And they'll receive a training, not as long as yours, but a very essential training. Maybe someday we'll call you in there. And of course you'll be rather glad that you came to Gilead. It won't be the same course, but it will be a very strong, 
a refresher course for all of the overseers that are called into the branch offices throughout the world to help them get a better appreciation of Jehovah's organization. The clearer our understanding is of Jehovah's organization, the better it is for us. But when you feel the responsibility that is upon God's people today, it is truly great. Think of it for a moment. More than 80,000 people coming into God's organization in a year, mere children, babies, that need to be trained and taught how to live a Christian life and how to make that life their vocation, their life's work, how to make them ordain ministers, how to help them get their ministerial garments on and keep them on and never get sleepy after they have once taken this uh, ministerial garment on, how to help them to stay away constantly and gain this eternal life which we have grasp of now. That's a tremendous responsibility. And within a few weeks now, you're going to get your March 15th watchtower in the English language. And that's going to tell you what uh, was accomplished in the month of December as far as people coming into Jehovah's organization is concerned and how many joined with us in preaching the good news. It's tremendous. I'm not going to tell you this morning. I'll let the watchtower tell you. But to think of all the people that come in and have associated themselves with Jehovah's organization, it astounds one. I'll tell you this much. It's greater than last year's April peak of publishers in the world. It's higher than that peak that you read in the yearbook for 1958 service year. Now, when you feel the weight of that responsibility falling upon us, of training these new ones that are coming into God's organization, then we must keep our ministerial garments on. We appreciate our ordination, whether we be a congregational publisher or one who is in the missionary or pioneer field within Jehovah's organization. They need care. How important then it is for every one of us to think of what we eat and what we drink and what we say and how we work so that our light shines all day long. It isn't a veneer that we have or just a a Christian while we're visiting with these people of goodwill, they're going to see us when we walk down the street. Or they're going to see us when we say hello. They're going to see us when we are under tension and when we are not in tension. And the way you act, the way you live, that Christian life is the thing that's going to help these people that are coming into the organization today. They're going to see you're different. They're going to say, you're really living as a Christian and they want to be like you. They want that same happiness, that same joy and, and pleasure that you get out of living. But some are too impatient to get it. They see we're happy and they want you to give it to them in a, in a nutshell. Well, tell me how to be like you in five minutes. No, <laughs> we can't do it in five minutes. You come with us, you study with us, you meet with us and you'll get like us but it's got to be in here, in the heart. So when it's in the heart and you let it flow uh, and bubble and uh, get everywhere in your territory, then you're going to be the ones that will be able to help these hundreds of thousands of people that are coming into Jehovah's organization today. So let us keep our ministerial garments on. Let us continue to be ordained ministers. That's what you'll all be. So when we give you these envelopes this morning, uh, it'll be a gift from the society with our very good wishes to carry on in the service. We'll remember you wherever you are and we will want to work with you just like you want to work with the society in the interest of the kingdom to push this great work of preaching the good news 
of God's kingdom unto the ends of the earth. And may Jehovah's rich blessing go with you in doing it. Now when you uh, come up here this morning and the picture of the school, you have a miniature of this one, but we'll... Uh, nice looking. So after you're gone, we're going to hang you up. <laughs> this is the most international uh, class we have ever had, so we'll have it up here and you can look it over, see how you look enlarged. <laughs> I believe that Brother Kuntz uh, has a message he wants to give to us now. Dear Brother Noor, we, the 130 students of the 32nd class of Gilead, representing 53 different lands, want to take opportunity on this grand occasion in our lives to humbly express our deepest and warmest expression of appreciation to all who made it possible for us to have such a spiritual, spiritually enlightening and pleasant stay at Gilead. First of all, we want to direct our gratefulness and praise to Jehovah, our lofty sovereign God in the ultimate position of the universe. He, as the greatest educator, has truly shown loving consideration in make it, making it possible for us to get this education of life-giving knowledge here at Gilead. Through his Holy Spirit, he has opened our eyes of spiritual discernment while we were drinking in the limitless supply of waters of truth found in his word. We express humble appreciation to his son, Christ Jesus, who is now enthroned in kingdom power for his direction of God's visible organization in the doing of Jehovah's will on earth at the present time. We give thanks to the faithful and discreet slave Jehovah's faithful sanctuary class, which has truly proved itself to be Jehovah's visible channel of communication by providing us with rich spiritual food through a deep study of the society's publications. We desire also to express our personal gratitude to you, Brother Noor, for inviting us to this school so that it was possible for us to be here and to receive the great wealth of knowledge and instruction. We remember also the loving expression shown in securing the material provisions of all necessities for our physical comfort and protection. Your occasional visits, along with other members of the Bethel family, and the warm, loving and instructive counsel we received showed us in clearer way the seriousness of our dedication vows and the purpose of our attending Gilead. Two, the zeal and devotion of the instructors has been an inspiring example to all of us. Realizing how we, as a student body, are made up of weak and imperfect ones, it has been a heartwarming experience to observe how the instructors have worked in our behalf with untiring and fully tested patience. Certainly, they gave us an example which we desire to follow when we have to deal with our brothers and persons of goodwill wherever we are privileged to serve. We remember also the daily labor of love of the farm family in our behalf to make our stay here comfortable, pleasant, and enjoyable. We are thankful to all these brothers also. We wish to acknowledge our indebtedness to the brothers worldwide whose contributions made it possible for us to be here. 
we will endeavor to prove that such contributions served their purpose by producing the kingdom fruitage that will bring praise to Jehovah. We are very grateful that we received assignments to 54 countries and that we are privileged to serve there full time in gathering the yet remaining other sheep. As we work in kingdom service, we want to walk ever humbly before Jehovah, our God of unfailing.